Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is James Sellers. I'm a faculty member at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And my talk title today is Finding Exact Values of Infinite Series. I have lots I wanna share with you today, so let's get started. So the goals for today are pretty straightforward. The first thing I wanna do is discuss the motivation for this talk. And that is going to be to find exact values of a variety of infinite series. And I'll talk more about uh, this motivation in just a moment. I'm also gonna talk through some of the basics of what we already know and don't know about finding exact values of infinite series. I wanna look at a historical approach to finding these exact values that goes back to Jacob Bernoulli in the late 17th century. And then I'm gonna to weave together a few tools that we learn in our calculus classes today to develop a technique for finding exact values of lots of different convergent infinite series. So I'm gonna actually show you tools and techniques that you already have seen, uh, but I'm gonna put them together in a way that's probably a bit different than what you've normally seen in order to find these exact values. And then at the very end of the talk, I'm gonna close with some cool examples. So here's this motivating question. What types of series do we know for which we can find the exact values? So you might just want to pause for a second and ask yourself, what kind of series, uh, sums of infinite numbers of numbers, can I find the exact values for those? And uh, the most common answer I get when I ask this question at talks that I give is geometric series. Well, hopefully you've seen the geometric series before. Here's one statement of it. For any real number x, where x has an absolute value less than one, we can take the sum one plus x plus x squared plus dot, dot, dot. That's a geometric series. And this equals exactly one over one minus x. Sometimes we show the formula with a constant a multiplied through the entire both left-hand side and right-hand side. And so you might be more familiar with the geometric series formula at the bottom of the screen right now, where the constant A has appeared on both left and right-hand sides. This is the geometric series. And because we know the right-hand side has this nice closed formula, either one over one minus X or A over one minus X, if we've multiplied by A, we have a way to find exact values of geometric series. That's a really cool thing. And it's an important thing for us as we try to use the geometric series later on in this talk. Well, there's another type of series that we do know the exact values for, which I won't talk about much today. And those are telescoping series. And one of the reasons I'm not gonna talk about them is there's not really a clean closed formula the way there is for geometric series when it comes to telescoping series. So I won't really touch on those today but I did want to admit to you that we do have exact values for telescoping series. So here's an interesting quote uh, from two authors, Pfaff and Tran. It appeared in an article they wrote in 2009 in the MAA's math magazine, mathematics magazine. Here's the quote. Students are sometimes unsatisfied when all they can say about an infinite series is that it converges with no information about the sum. Of course, they have their geometric and telescoping series whose limits are easily computed. So here's Pfaff and Tran basically saying exactly what I said on the previous slide. Namely, if we move away from geometric series and telescoping series, we typically can only say whether a series converges or diverges without knowing the exact value of the series. And today, my goal is to change that uh, for many of us. All right. So in a lot of our courses, we spend very little time learning about how to find these exact values of convergent infinite series. We spend a lot more time learning about lots of convergence tests, like the ratio test, and we use those to determine whether a series converges or not. But in the process of doing that, we gain almost no, if not no, intuition about the exact value of the series. So for example, we spend time determining whether this series, sum n equals one to infinity of n divided by two to the n converges. Well, if you know the ratio test, 
it turns out that you can prove that this series converges almost immediately with the ratio test. You can probably write the work that you have to write for the ratio test for this series on a post-it note or a three by five card. It's really not difficult to show that it converges. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell you anything about the exact value of the sum. Well, interestingly enough, that sum, sum n equals one to infinity of n over two to the n is exactly two. Yep, two. Not 2.0000001, not 1.9999983. It's exactly two. And of course, if you know that the series is exactly two, then the question of whether it converges or not is unnecessary to ask because once you know it equals this finite value of two, you know that that implies that the series converges. So my question today is, why wouldn't we learn how to find the exact values of these series when we can, rather than using the convergence tests? That's really the question. And by the way, just an interesting side note, um, a Frenchman named Orem proved that this sum is exactly equal to two in the 14th century. So the fact that that sum equals two has been known for many, many years. Jacob Bernoulli reproved this same result and lots of other results of this form in his work, Tractatus de Cerebus Infinitus, which is written in Latin, was published after Bernoulli's death in 1689. And the fact that Bernoulli knew that this sum was equal to two can be seen in the following table that comes from Tractatus de Cerebus Infinitus. Uh, so there's a lot of Latin at the beginning, don't worry about that so much, but look at this first row of the actual table. I've put a little box around it. Uh, it reads one half plus two fourths plus three eighths plus four over 16 plus five over 32. Then there's an et cetera symbol, which is sort of like our dot, dot, dot today. And then his equal sign looks like a bit of an infinity symbol with a piece missing from it. And then on the very right side of that line, you see two. This is exactly the sum we've been talking about, and it shows that Bernoulli knew that it was equal to exactly two. So I'd actually like to take a few minutes today and show you Bernoulli's approach to finding this exact value. Uh, I'm not exactly sure this is the way I would want us to do this work all the time, but I think it's instructive to actually see a historical perspective on how one would build this exact value or how we'd find this exact value. So Bernoulli begins with a more general series, which I'm gonna write as capital S. I'm gonna write it as one over D plus two over D squared plus three over Q D cubed plus four over D to the fourth plus dot, dot, dot. So for Bernoulli, little d is going to equal two in a moment. Here I've written it in summation notation, sum n equals one to infinity n over d to the n. So this is capital S. Bernoulli then takes this series and he splits it in a very interesting way. So let me show you that uh, at this time. Here is Bernoulli's original series, one over d plus two over d squared plus three over d cubed plus four over d to the four plus dot, dot, dot. And now Bernoulli is going to split it in a vertical fashion. So he has this one over D, he writes that as a one over D below. Two over D squared is one over D squared plus one over D squared. Three over D cubed is one over D cubed plus one over D cubed plus one over D cubed. And he does the same thing with four over D to the four. He writes it as four copies of one over D to the four. Okay, so this series, when you sum it all up, is going to be the sum of all of these terms. And now Bernoulli says, now look horizontally at what we have below this solid horizontal line. So the first row, one over D plus one over D squared plus one over D cubed plus one over D to the four plus dot, dot, dot. I hope we recognize that as a geometric series. The first term is one over D, and then we're gonna multiply by one over D to get from each term to the next. So this is a geometric series. The second row uh, below the solid horizontal line, one over D squared plus one over D cubed plus one over D to the four plus dot, dot, dot. That's also a geometric series. 
It has a different first term, one over d squared, and it has the same ratio, if you will, of one over d. To get from one over d squared to one over d cubed, you multiply by one over d. To get from one over d cubed to one over d to the four, you multiply by one over d, and so on. And if you think about it now, every one of these horizontal sums is going to be a geometric series. And thanks to the formula that we saw earlier in the talk, we know exactly how to find each of these geometric series sums. They're equal to this. Now, the formula would not have immediately given you, for example, one over D minus one or one over D squared minus D. But if you write down the formula and then do some simplification, these are exactly the values of each of those geometric series. Now, before I go anywhere with that, let me just point out that each of those can be written a little bit differently with just some gentle factoring. And this is what they equal. So let me just back up and show you again. D squared minus D in this denominator is the same as D times D minus one. D cubed minus D squared is the same as D squared times D minus one and so on. Okay, so let's now recap, where are we? This series, which I wanted to find is now equal to the sum of these right-hand sides that I see here of the form one over a power of D times the quantity D minus one. So that's S. And so now I'm gonna rewrite that this way. So I've taken those terms that I had on the right-hand sides, I've now written them, in, written them in a horizontal form. And now if you stare at those, you realize that that's a geometric series again. The first term is one over D minus one, and then if you take that term and multiply it by one over D, you get the second term. If you multiply that by one over D, you get the third term. If you multiply that by one over D, you get the fourth term and so on. So this S after I've rewritten it is now just a geometric series. And so I can use the formula to find the exact value. It's going to be first term. This is like the value A that we saw earlier in the talk divided by the one minus ratio, one minus X we saw in the previous formula several slides ago, that would be one minus D, one minus one over D. And so I just start to simplify this a bit, get a common denominator in the denominator. I flip this D minus one over D up, multiply, and this is the result. And that term on the right-hand side is a closed formula. So this sum S that I began with which originally had one, two, three, four, and so on in the numerators of the terms is exactly equal to D over the quantity D minus one squared. So this was the original sum that I wanted and D is equal to two in order to get the powers of two in the denominator. And so when I plug in my formula or plug in D equals two into my formula, I just get two over the quantity two minus one squared, which is two over one, which is two. And that was the original result that we saw earlier in Bernoulli's table. Now there's nothing special about the power of two in these denominators. This two, four, eight, 16, they could have been powers of three or five, or for that matter, they could have been powers of pi or E. But in this case, we wanted to look at two because that was the example that Bernoulli showed in his table. But as a separate example, I could allow D to be seven. And so here I see the series one over seven plus two over seven squared plus three over seven cubed plus four over seven to the four plus dot, dot, dot. And using Bernoulli's formula, I know that that sum is exactly equal to seven over seven minus one quantity squared, which is seven over 36. So this series, which some of you have probably been asked to prove converges via the ratio test, not only does it converge, it equals exactly seven over 36. It's a really wonderful result. And that's a lot more than we would have ever learned from just using the ratio test. Well, Bernoulli did much, much more in his book uh, from 1689. But to be honest with you, there are much more modern ways to find the exact values of lots of series. And I want to transition to those today. So let's move on to that more modern approach. 
So the tools that we need in order to complete this work are tools that I'm guessing many of you have seen before. The geometric series, which we've already used today, differentiation of power series, and we learn in our course that you can differentiate power series term by term. And we also learn that we can evaluate power series at certain values of the variable, as long as those values are in the interval of convergence. So this is all language uh, and mathematics that you've heard in the past. The issue is that in most cases, we don't weave these tools together in the way I'm gonna show them to you today. So many students don't realize that they can find the exact values of many different, in fact, infinitely many different convergence series. So I wanna demonstrate that to you today. So my starting point is going to be the geometric series. I'm gonna call this equation number one. So don't be too distracted by that one over there. I'm going back to my geometric series where I just have the first term equal to one. So this is the geometric series formula. And let's remember that this is only true when the absolute value of X is less than one. That's my interval of convergence. And now what I'm gonna do is differentiate both sides of this equation. This is perfectly legal mathematics to do. And when I differentiate that equation with respect to X, the derivative of one becomes zero, the derivative of the X becomes this one, the derivative of X squared becomes two X, the derivative of X cubed becomes three X squared and so on. And so what I've done is I've dropped the exponent down in front and made it into a coefficient, if you will, in front of each power of X. The right hand side is going to require the quotient rule, which we know, and it's not too complicated to get this right hand side via that quotient rule. So this is now a new true statement about power series. And by the way, it has the same interval of convergence that we had with the geometric series. Okay, so that paragraph or that sentence just says exactly what I just said to you. And then what I'm gonna do is multiply both sides of the equation by X. Now, if you multiply that left-hand side by X, you have to distribute that X across all the terms on the left-hand side. And on the right side, if you go back and look, all I've done here is just put the X in the numerator of the right-hand side. The original right-hand side on the previous screen was one over one minus X quantity squared. So, I've multiplied that previous line by an X on both sides. I'm gonna call that equation two. I wanna point out that the exponents now on the right hand side, on the left hand side, my apologies, the exponents are exactly the same as the coefficients in front of each term. And that's an important fact that we'll look at a little bit later. Now, I didn't alter the interval of convergence. And so now I'm allowed to plug in any value of X that I want, as long as that value of X satisfies absolute value of X less than one. I can plug in anything for X here that I want in that interval of convergence. So for example, I'm going to evaluate this equation line at X equals one half. That would definitely be in the interval of convergence. And when I do that, the one half squared, one half cubed, one half to the fourth is going to put powers of two in the denominators of each of these terms. And I'm gonna end up with this series on the left. And that is the same series we were looking at from Bernoulli a few minutes ago. Now X is one half. Remember my right-hand side is X over the quantity one minus X squared. I plug in one half, I plug in one half for X there. I start to simplify and I get two. And we already saw a moment ago that this series equals two. But this is now a modern way to see how to find that exact value of two. This is exactly what Bernoulli had done in 1689. And there it is again in summation notation. I always think it's good to see that uh, notation as often as we can. Now, again, this is much more helpful than the ratio test, which is only gonna tell you that the series would have converged. And there's nothing special about X equals one half. We could have plugged in, for example, X equals one third or X equals two sevenths or any X that satisfies absolute value of X is less than one. So let me show you what you get when you plug in those values, X equals a third and X equals two sevenths 
into this series, into this power series statement. Okay. So here's what you get when X is a third. First of all, the series now becomes the sum N over three to the N. This is what it looks like when you write it out in a few terms with a dot, dot, dot notation. X is now a third. You plug in those values into the formula and do a little simplification and you get three fourths. This series is exactly three fourths. And when X is two sevenths, you get something a little more complicated looking. You now have two to the N times N in the numerator and seven to the N in the denominators. This is what the um, terms look like when you write out the first few terms, but the formula is still the same. And if you plug that in, you'll get exactly 14 over 25. This series isn't close to 14 over 25. It equals 14 over 25. It's a wonderful result. And it's the kind of series that I'm guessing most of us would not have actually found an exact value for. We would have simply shown that it converged or diverged. And that's just the beginning. Let's go back now to the same statement. And I'm going to differentiate both sides with respect to X again. And since I multiplied earlier by an extra X, and this exponent is now the same as the coefficient in front of every term on the left, the differentiation term by term on the left is going to give me nice coefficients of squares. And of course, the right-hand side just requires a quotient rule again. And is it a little messy? Sure. Is it difficult? Absolutely not. It may take a little bit of time, but it can be easily done. And so the left-hand side gets differentiated by the power rule. The right-hand side gets differentiated by the quotient rule. And now we have a really nice result where the coefficients are the squares. One squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, and so on. Before I go anywhere, though, I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation again by x. Again, because I want alignment, if you will, of these exponents with the coefficients. And so I multiply the right-hand side by an x as well. I have to multiply both sides by x if I'm going to keep the equality. And that means in summation notation, this is the sum I have. But I hope you now see what I'm going to do. I'm going to suggest that we plug in a value of x in the interval of convergence. It'll give us a particular series on the left and it'll give us a closed formula on the right. So for example, if you plug in x equals one half here, one half raised to the end will make powers of two in the denominators. That's what I see here. These numerators are squares. I plug in the x equal one half on the right hand side as well, and I get this and I simplify it, and that equals exactly six. This arithmetic gets you to six. So this series, is exactly six. Well, I suggest we repeat the process once more. Let's go back to our series, this one, and let's differentiate both sides with respect to X again and multiply both sides by X after the differentiation is done. This N is going to come down from the power rule and give me an N cubed in front. The multiplication by X will bring this back to an X to the N the right-hand side requires the quotient rule. We can do it. And this is what we get after we differentiate and multiply by x. So now I can plug in values of x, and I can do that on both sides, and I can get exact values of sums where the cubes show up as parts of the terms in the series. It's really cool, at least for me, I think it's cool. And so again, for example, if x is 1 half, I plug that in, it puts powers of 2 in the denominator, this is my series in question. This is what I get from the right-hand side when I plug in x equals a half. I do the simplification and I get exactly 26. And again, I want to point out, it's not 26.001. It's exactly 26. This series is exactly 26. So here's a summary of those last two results. I'm just retyped them for you here. Uh, the first one has the squares in the numerators. The second one has the cubes in the numerators and they are exactly six and 26. And you might ask me, did Bernoulli know these in 1689? Absolutely. Here's that same table again that I showed you earlier. Look at these bottom two rows, six and 26. 
and you have the squares in the numerators here and the cubes in the numerators there. So these are really cool exact results. And again, the fact that I kept plugging in x equals one half is not special at all. So let me show you a summary of the kind of thing we could do to find the exact values of infinitely many different convergent infinite series. Stare with me for just a moment at this sum. This is the sum n equals one to infinity, n to the j over k to the n. j is going to be any positive integer you want, one, two, three, et cetera, and k is gonna be a real number greater than one. So for example, right before we got to this slide, we were looking at n to the three over two to the n. The numerator will be a polynomial term, power term, if you will, and the denominator will be an exponential function, k to the n. Now, you can actually find the exact value of this if you do the following. Start with the geometric series, differentiate that with respect to x, and multiply by x a total of j times. This is the value of j. So I'm saying here, differentiate, multiply by x. Differentiate again, multiply by x again. Keep doing that exactly j times. And then you substitute x equals one over k. By substituting one over k, it's going to put the k to the n in the denominator. And if k is bigger than one, then one over k will be less than one. And since it's positive, it'll be greater than zero. This will fit in the interval of convergence. And you'll know the exact value then by looking at the right-hand side, which is going to be a bit messy because it comes from all those quotient rules. But once you plug in the one over K, whatever K is, and you simplify, you will have the exact value of your series. And I think that's much more satisfying than simply finding out whether one of these series converges or diverges. Well, let me close today with what I think is a really cool example. And to do that, I need to start, start talking about some sequences of numbers. So we've talked about the natural numbers today, one, two, three, four, five. Some people call these the counting numbers. And now what I want to do is the following. On the next row, I'm going to start with a one, and then I'm going to take partial sums of the natural numbers. So I'm going to take one plus two, which is three, one plus two plus three, which is six, one plus two plus three plus four, which is 10, one plus two plus three plus four plus five, which is 15. These are known as the triangular numbers. And then I'm going to do the same game again in the next row. Start with a one, one plus three is four, 1 plus 3 plus 6 is 10. 1 plus 3 plus 6 plus 10 is 20. 1 plus 3 plus 6 plus 10 plus 15 is 35, and so on. And these also have a special name. They're known as the pyramidal numbers or pyramidal numbers. Now, these numbers and these names were actually studied by Greek mathematicians, contemporaries of people like Euclid and Pythagoras, uh, at least 2,000 years ago. So these are very special sequences of numbers, and they would have also been very well known to Bernoulli and his contemporaries in the 17th century. In fact, we've already seen them in Bernoulli's work. Here's that table again. Look with me again for just a moment at the numerators of the first three sums. One, two, three, four, five, those are the natural numbers. One, three, six, 10, 15, those are the triangular numbers. One, four, 10, 20, 35, those are, those are the pyramidal numbers. And of course, in Latin, uh, Bernoulli has written them on the left-hand side in this way. Now, the question is, how does Bernoulli find these sums? And more importantly, is there a pattern? That's actually what I want to close with today. So these are the first three rows of that table, just read typeset so we can read them a little more uh, cleanly. Notice that they equal two, four, and eight on the right-hand side as exact values. Now, the question I have for you is, what's the next obvious series that Bernoulli might have wanted to study if he hadn't stopped where he stopped? Well, remember, the numerators here were used to build the numerators of the second row by partial sums, and the numerators of the second row were used to build the numerators of the third row. If we used the same logic, the numerators of the next row would be 1, 5, which is 1 plus 4, 15, which is 1 plus 4 plus 10, and so on. 
So these would be uh, the partial sums of the previous numerators. And you might ask yourself, does that series have an exact value as well? And it does, and it's equal to 16. And now it is not a surprise or a coincidence that these numbers, 2, 4, 8, 16, are following a really nice pattern. They are the powers of 2. And if you were to do the next series again, you would get the next power of 2 and so on. You can continue to calculate these as much as you want. They will always be these powers of 2. And the proof, basically, is to start with the geometric series and take derivatives, but you don't take the derivative and then multiply by x and take the derivative and multiply by x. You start with the geometric series in this case, and you take a derivative with respect to x, and then you take another derivative with respect to x again immediately. And you keep doing the derivative part first, all in a row. Then you multiply by the corresponding copies of x together. You need a little extra constant to throw into each one, just a number that gets multiplied in. You substitute x equals 1 half, and you get these results, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. So this gives us another example of an infinite family of exact values of infinite series. And these are available using the tools that you learn in your AP Calculus class. And I think that's a really, really cool thing. Well, I hope you've enjoyed uh, learning about these exact values of infinite series. I hope you'll use some of these tools in your own courses. And I thank you very much for joining me today.